Book 11. Prowess and wounds of Achaean's dawn came up from the couch of her reclining, leaving her lord Tithono's brilliant side with fresh light in her arms for gods and men, and Zeus commanded strife down to the beachhead, hard-bitten goddess, bearing in her hands the storm-cloud sign of war. At the dead center upon Odysseus' black-tarred ship she paused, in earshot of both wings, if a man shouted, as far as Aeus Quarters and Achilles. Confident of their powers, these had beached their ships at the far right and the far left. Now from Odysseus' lugger strife gave tongue to a shivering cry. It stirred Achaean hearts to battle without rest, now warfare seemed lovelier than return, lovelier than sailing in the decked ships to their own native land. The son of Atreus cried out, troops in arms, and clothed himself in armor of bright bronze. Upon his legs he fitted beautiful greaves with silver ankle straps. Around his chest he buckled on a cuirass, long ago a pledge of friendship from the Lord Kinias, who heard his fame at Kypros, on the eve of the Achaean sailings against Troy. To please the Achaean king he made this gift, a cuirass with ten bands of dark enamel, twelve of gold, twenty of tin. Dark blue enamel serpents, three on either side, arched toward the neck, like rainbows that Lord Zeus will pose on cloud as presages to men. Across his shoulder and chest he hung a sword whose hilt bore shining golden studs, and bands of silver glinted on the scabbard, hooked to a gilt baldric. Next he took his shield, a broad one and a work of art for battle, circled ten times with bronze, the twenty studs were pale tin round the rim, the central boss dark blue enamel that a fire-eyed gorgon's horrifying moor enclosed, with rout and terror flanking her. Silver the shield strap whereon a dark blue serpent twined, three heads, put forth by one trunk, flexing every way. Then Agamemnon fitted on his brow a helmet double-ridged, with four white crests of horsehair nodding savagely above it. Last, two tough spears he took, with brazen spearheads wetted sharp, and that clear bronze reflected gleams of sunlight far into heaven. Athena thundered overhead, and Hera thundered honor in heaven to golden Mykines lord. Now every captain told his charioteer, dress on the moat, hold hard here, and on foot in battle gear, with weapons, all these fighters moved ahead. Into the sky of dawn an irrepressible cry went up, as lines of men preceded war cars at the moat and war cars in support came just behind. Now Zeus the son of Kronos roused an uproar along this host, and sprinkled bloody dew from highest heaven, being resolved that day to crowd great warriors into the undergloom. Across the moat, on rising ground, the Trojans mustered around tall Hector, noble Pulidamas, Aeneas, whom they honored as a god, Antinor's three sons, Polybos, Agenor, and young Akamas, godlike prince. Hector moved forward with his round-faced shield. As from night clouds a baleful summer star will blaze into the clear, then fade in cloud, so Hector shone in front or became hidden when he harangued the rear ranks, his whole form in bronze a flash like lightning of Father Zeus. Imagine at each end of a rich man's field a line of reapers formed, who cut a swath in barley or wheat, and spiky clumps of grain are brought low by the scything, even so those armies moved to cut each other down, and neither Trojans nor Achaeans thought of ruinous retreat. The line of battle held them face to face, lunging like wolves, and Strife who thrives on groaning looked on that field in joy, for she alone of goddesses or gods mixed in the fighting. The rest were absent now and were at ease in great halls of their own, beautiful chambers built for immortals on Olympo's ridges, all being bitter against the dark storm king for decreeing this day's battle to the Trojans. But their father ignored them. In his chair withdrawn from all, he gloried, looking down on wall and ship and metal flash of battle, men slaying others, and the quiet slain. While the sun rose and morning grew in splendor, javelins were launched and soldiers fell on both sides equally. But at the hour a woodsman takes his lunch in a cool grove of mountain pines, when he has grown arm-weary chopping tall timber down, and, sick of labor, longs for refreshment, at that height of noon Danans calling fiercely back and forth broke the Trojan line. First Agamemnon charged and killed a Trojan chief, Bienna, and Oileus, his charioteer, this man dismounted to face him, I. But only met a spear thrust square between the eyes, unchecked by his bronze helmet rim. Through bronze and home the spearhead broke into the brain within and left it spattered. Down he went. And Marshal Agamemnon abandoned Bienna and Oileus with glistening bare chests when he had stripped them. Onward he went to kill two sons of Priam, Isos and Antiphos, one bastard stripling, one in the royal line, both brothers riding a single chariot. Isos held the reins with Antiphos, the gently bred, beside him. These two one day, while they were tending flocks in Ida's vales, Achilles took and bound with willow shoots, but later freed for ransom. 
Now the lord of the great plains, Agamemnon, hit one with a spear cast in the chest above the nipple, the other, Antiphos, he struck with his long sword beside the ear, toppling him from his car. He bent to take their arms and knew them, he had seen them once in the encampment by the ships, that day Achilles brought them down the mountainside. A lion, discovering a forest bed, and picking up in his great fangs the fawns of a swift doe, will shake and break their backs and rend their tender lives away with ease, while she is powerless to help, though near, but feels a dreadful trembling come upon her, bolting the spot, she leaps through underbrush at full stretch, drenched in sweat, before the onset of the strong beast of prey. Just so, not one among the Trojans could prevent those two from being destroyed, the rest, too, turned and ran. Next came Paisandros and Hippolochos, sons of Antimachos. Expecting gold and gifts of luxury from Alexandros, Antimachos had harangued against returning Helen to Menelos. Now his sons were caught by Agamemnon. Both were driving a single chariot, when the shining reins ran out of their limp hands, and panic shook them, Agamemnon, bounding like a lion, faced them. But they begged him from the car, O son of Atreus, take us alive. Be sure you shall have fitting ransom. Treasures lie by hundreds in Antimaco's great hall, things made of bronze and gold and hard-wrought iron. Our father would not count the cost in these, if he could know we are still alive amid the Achaean ships. So they appealed to him in tears, and begged for mercy from the king, but heard a voice beyond appeal, Ah, you are Antimaco's sons. On Troy's assembly ground when Menelos went there with Odysseus to make our argument, Antimaco's held out for killing both men then and there and no safe conduct back to the Achaeans. That is the infamy you'll pay for now. With this he hit Paisandros in the chest with a spear thrust that threw him from the chariot and smashed him on his back. Hippolochos leapt, but Agamemnon caught him on the ground with one sword cut, then slashed his arms away and sent him rolling out amid the melee like a round mortar stone. He left them there. And now, wherever Trojans in the mass were thrown most into confusion, there he charged, and soldiers of Achaia ran along behind him. Infantry killed infantry in forced retreat, and chariot fighters killed chariot fighters. Dust rose underfoot as thudding hooves of horses shook the plain and men plied deadly bronze. King Agamemnon, calling the Argives in the chariot's wake, pressed on, slaughtering. As a fire catches in parching brushwood without trees, and wind this way and that in a whirl carries the blaze to burn off crackling thickets to the root, so under Agamemnon's whirling charge the routed Trojans fell. Metalsome teams drew empty clattering cars down lanes of war, bereft of drivers. These lay on the field, more lovable to kites than to their wives. But Zeus mysteriously guided Hector out of the spears and dust, out of the slaughter, out of the blood and tumult, while Atreides led the chase and cheered the Danans on. Past the old tomb of Elos in midplain the Trojans streamed, and past the wild fig tree, fighting to reach the city, and Agamemnon followed with battle cries, attacking ever, bloodying his inexorable hands. At last they reached the west gate and the oak and halted there, awaiting one another, as those behind in midplane struggled on like cows a lion terrifies at dusk into a stampede. One cow at a time will see breathtaking death, clamped on her neck with powerful fangs, the lion crunches her to make his kill, then gulps her blood and guts. Even so in pursuit was Agamemnon, forever killing laggards as they fled. Dozens fell, thrown head first from the chariots, or on their backs, as with his spear he ran around them and ahead. Now, in the end, when he was near the city and the wall, to earth from heaven the father of gods and men descended and sat down on Ida's crests amid her springs, bearing his jagged lightning. He made Iris of golden wings his herald, saying, Away with you who walk the wind, tell this to Hector, while he still can see Lord Marshal Agamemnon in the forefront, devastating the ranks, let him retire and call on other troops to fight, to bear the brunt of battle with his enemies. But when spear cast or bowshot hits the man so that he mounts his chariot again, at that point I give Hector power of massacre down to the deep sea ships of the Achaeans, till the sun dips and starry darkness comes. Iris who walks on the swift wind obeyed him, running down Ida's hills to Ilion. Their godlike Hector, son of Priam, stood amid the horses and the welded cars, and swooping down like wind Iris addressed him, son of Priam, Hector, great in craft of battle, Zeus commissioned me to tell you, while you can see Lord Marshal Agamemnon in the forefront, devastating the ranks, you must retire, and call on other troops to bear the brunt of battle with your enemies. But when the man is hit, by spear or bowshot, so that he takes to his chariot again, at that point Zeus will give you power of massacre as far as the deep sea ships of the Achaeans, till the sun dips and starry darkness comes. 
When she had said this, Iris veered away, and from his chariot Hector vaulted down, shaking his wetted spears, making the rounds to put fight into Trojans everywhere and rouse a bloody combat. Now they turned and held a line again against Achaeans, whom on their side new companies reinforced. They closed up ranks for action hand to hand and Agamemnon strove to outstrip them all. Heaven dwelling muses of Olympos, tell me who first, among allies or Trojans, braved Agamemnon? It was young Iphidamas, Antinor's brawny and athletic son, who had been reared in Thrace, that fertile country, billowy grassland, nourisher of flocks. Kisses, father of Theno, his mother, brought up the child, and when he reached the stage of promising manhood tried to hold him there, betrothing to him a daughter. But he left his bridal chamber for the Achaean war when the word came. Twelve ships put out with him, and these he duly beached at Pacote, making his way to Ilion on foot. Now it was he who tackled Agamemnon. When they came near each other, Agamemnon thrust but missed as the half turned in his hand. Iphidama's point went home below the cuirass hard on the belt. He put his weight on it with heavy thews, leaning after the blow, but could not pierce the armoured loin guard. Rather, his point was turned, like lead on silver bent. The lord of the great plains now took hold and drew the weapon toward him, raging, lion-like, wrenching it from the Trojan's hands, then struck him with a sword cut across the neck and killed him. Down he dropped into the sleep of bronze. Sad that he fought for the townsman of his bride and died abroad before he could enjoy her, lavish though he had been for her, he gave one hundred beeves, and promised a thousand head of sheep and goats, four myriads grazed his land. Now Agamemnon stripped his corpse and bore amid the Achaean host his beautiful armour. Kuhn saw him, Kuhn, a notable fighter, eldest son of Antinor, and cruel grief clouded his eyes at the downfall of his brother. Taking Agamemnon on the flank he hit his arm below the elbow, straight through skin and tendon past the bright spear point. Now the Lord Marshal Agamemnon shuddered, not that he quit the battle, not at all, but swung on Kuhn with gale-hardened spear, the man by now furiously pulling his brother, Iphidamas, by the foot, calling his peers. But as he pulled the corpse to the Trojan side Agamemnon sent home his polished spear and mortally wounded him under his shield. He moved in to behead him, and the head rolled on Iphidamas. Thus Antinor's sons had met their destiny at a trade's hands, entering the gloom of death. And still the victor roamed back and forth along the living ranks with spear and sword attacking, or with stones, as long as hot blood gushed from his wound. But when his blood no longer flowed, and the gash dried, then rays of pain lacerated Agamemnon. Comparable to the throes a writhing woman suffers in hard labour sent by the goddesses of travail, Heros' daughters, twisters, mistresses of pangs, the anguish throbbed in Agamemnon now. Mounting his chariot, he told the driver, make for the ships, and saw at heart he was, but raised a piercing cry to the Danans, friends, nobles, captains of Argives, now the fight is yours, to beat the tide of battle back from our ships, for Zeus who views the wide world would not give me leave to battle against Trojans all this day. His driver whipped the beautiful chariot horses back to the ships, and willingly they ran with foaming chests, and dust coating their bellies, to bear the wounded king out of the battle. Hector had kept his eyes on this departure and gave a shout to Trojans and Lycians, Trojans, Lycians, and Dardan spears, remember Valor, friends, and fight like men. Their champion has left the field. Oh, here, here is my great chance, granted me by Zeus. Now forward with your teams into the center and win the highest prize of all. He stirred them, rallying each man's courage. As a hunter would send his hounds against a lion or boar so Hector sent his Trojans headlong in against the Achaeans, Hector, Priam's son, hard as the war god, now in pride and zeal this hunter led his fighters on. He fell on the battle line like a high screaming squall that blows down on the purple open sea. And who were the adversaries that he killed when Zeus accorded him this rush of glory? Asios first, Autonus and Opites, Dollops Clytides, Aphelsios, Agilaus, Asimnos, Aurus, Rugged Hipponus, these leaders of Danans he destroyed, then turned on the rank and file. A lashing gale out of the west will rift high snowy clouds the south wind piled, as big seas rise and roll with foam and spindrift from the whistling wind, so were Actaean masses rent by Hector. Ruin was near, irreparable defeat, Achaeans all but driven on the ships, had not Odysseus called to Diomedes, son of great Tydeus, what has come over us? Have we lost all our power of attack? Come here and stand with me, old horse. Dishina lies ahead if Hector fires the ships. Diomedes answered him, I'll stand with you and take what comes, by heaven. Only small good it will do us. 
Lord Zeus, master of cloud, wills them the upper hand, and not ourselves. At this he knocked Thimbraos from his chariot with a direct hit on the left breast. Odysseus killed Molion, the squire to that lord. From these who were out of action, they turned round against the pursuing pack, you would have said two boars that turned on hounds, and charging back did slaughter among Trojans. Thus the Achaeans had some relief, a respite, as they yielded before magnificent Hector. Next, the two destroyed a Trojan pair in their war car, sons of Merops Pacogios, clairvoyant beyond all men, who had denied his son's permission to join man-wasting war. But they paid him no heed, dark death spirits led them on, and now the incomparable spearman Diams ripped them out of life and took their gear. Hippodamas besides Hyperokos went down before Odysseus, who stripped them. For a short time, down gazing out of Ida, Zeus kept the battle doubtful, tense and even, as each side made its kills. Now Diams fighting Agastrophos, a son of Pen, gave him a hip wound, but the warrior's chariot was not at hand to save him, a bad error, his driver held it far away. On foot Agastrophos went limping through the fight until he perished. Looking across at this, Hector attacked the Achaeans with a yell while Trojan companies fell in behind. Diams shivered as he watched him come and turning said to Odysseus beside him, we are the ones this wave is heading for, a black wave, too, here is Hector in his power. Come, let's brace for it and defend ourselves. He whirled and cast, and the long spear trailed swift shadow straight to the mark he aimed for, the helm crest, but it rebounded, clanging, bronze from bronze, and never reached or broke his handsome skin, the ridged and triple welded helm Apollo gave him was impervious. But Hector swerved in shock and, running wide, rejoined his men. Then fallen on his knees he leaned on his great hand, and a black swoon veiled his eyes. While Diams went a long way down the line, tracking his weapon to where it lay, Hector got back his breath and, once more mounted on his chariot, he rode among the other cars and shunned the shadow of death. Diams shook his spear and called, you dodged away from death again, you dog, and a close thing, too, Phoebos Apollo pulled you through. He it must be you pray to whenever you go near the jolt of spears. One more throw, by heaven, will finish you, if there is any god on my side, too. Now I'll face any others I can find. He leaned over to strip the son of Pan, and then the lord of Helen, Alexandros, resting against the gravestone on the mound of Elos, patriarch son of Dardanos, bent his bow at the lord marshal Diams. Imagine Diams taking the dead man's cuirass from his ribs, and from his shoulders the shield all glimmering, and his heavy helm, even as the adversary drew his bow to the grip and shot, and not in vain the arrow sprang from his fist, but through the right foot bonework of Diams into the earth it punched. Alexandros jumped out of ambush laughing and called to him vaunting, hit you are, and hard. No wasted shot, that. But I should have hit you under the ribs and brought you down. That would relieve the Trojans from their ordeal. You spook them as a lion does bleating goats. Undaunted, Diams answered, you bow and arrow boy, you curly head, all eyes for little girls, I wish you'd try me face to face with pike and shield, your archery would do you no good then. You brag this way for having scratched my instep. It is nothing, a woman's shot, or a silly little boy's. A weak need half wit's arrow has no point. By heaven, arrows of mine are wetted differently. One that grazes a man will stretch him dead. His woman's cheeks are torn with grief, his children orphaned. He must soak the earth and rot, with kites for company, not women. As he said this, Odysseus moved over and stood in front of him. Then, sitting back, Diams pulled the arrow from his foot and dragged agony with it through his flesh. He climbed his chariot and told his driver, make for the ships. And he was grieved at heart. Odysseus now, the good spear, stood alone, no Argive held that ground with him, as fear had gripped them all. And grimly vexed, he spoke to his own valor, here is trouble. What will become of me? A black day, this, if I show fear and run before this crowd, but worse if I am captured, being alone. Zeus routed all the rest of the Danans. But why this bandying inward words, my friend? Cowards are men who leave the front in war. The man who will be worth respect in battle holds on, whether his hit or hits another. During these meditations, on they came, the lines of Trojan infantry, and broke around and hemmed him in, hemmed in their peril. As when around a wild boar lusty hunters and hounds deploy, until the beast trots out from heavy thicket, wetting his white tusks against his lower jaws, the hounds go circling into attack, 
and under the hue and cry a gnashing sound of tusks and teeth is heard, even so now, around rugged Odysseus, the Trojans ran. Deipites was the first Odysseus wounded, on the slope of shoulder, making a spring with his sharp spear, and next he hit Thune and Enomos and killed them, then Cursidamas, who had vaulted down out of his car, he caught square in the navel under his bulging shield, the man fell hard in dust and with his hand spread gripped the earth. Leaving them there, he hit Hippocides Carops, a brother of the rich man, Sokos, and Sokos gallantly ran up to shield him, taking a stand before the attacker, saying, Odysseus, great in all men's eyes, unwearied master of guile and toil, today the sons of Hippasos will be your claim to glory, either you kill and strip such men as these or die, hit by my spear. Even as he spoke, he let fly at the round shield, and his weapon pierced the shining surface, pierced the bright elaborate cuirass with his weight behind it, flaying Odysseus' ribs. Athena barred all access to her hero's heart and lungs. Odysseus knew the wound had not been mortal, and yielding ground he said to Sokos, Ah, poor soldier, your own death plunge into the dark lies before you now, you crippled me for any further fight today with Trojans, but as for you, I say a bloody death, a black nightmare of death, is close upon you, my spear kills you. You'll give up the fight to me, your soul to that strong driver, death. This made the other turn as if to run, but as he turned the spear crashed in his back between the shoulders, driving through his chest, and down he went with clanging gear. Odysseus made his boast over the fallen, son of Hippasos, that fighting man and horseman, death ran ahead to meet you, no escape. Poor soldier, father and mother will not bend to close your eyes in death, but carrion birds will tear them out and clap their wings around you. My own corpse will be fired by the Achaeans if in fact I die. On this he drew Soko's hard weapon from his flesh and threw his convex shield. After the extracted spearhead blood welled up in streams and grieved his heart. Elated when they saw Odysseus' blood flow out, the Trojans yelled, converging on him. Now he gave ground, backing away, and called his own companions. Three tremendous shouts he gave, as loud as a man's head could hold and each time he was heard by Menelos, who turned and said to Ias at his side, son of Telamon and the gods of old, Lord Ias of the army, a faint shout has reached my ears, Odysseus' voice it is, as though the man were in trouble, and great trouble, with Trojans who had cut him off alone. We must get through the melee, better save him. I am afraid some hurt will come to him, and loss irreparable to the Achaeans. At this he led the way, and Ias followed, godlike, formidable, and before long they found Odysseus, Trojans had closed round him as tawny jackals from the hills will ring an antler deer, gone heavy with his wound. After the hunter's arrow strikes, the deer goes running clean away, he runs as long as warm blood flows and knees can drive him on. Then when at last the feathered arrow downs him, carrion jackals in a shady grove devour him. But now some power brings down a ravenous lion, and the shrinking jackals go off cowering, he must have their prey. Just so around Odysseus, man of war with versatile wits, the Trojans closed. But he by stabbing out and fainting with his spear averted death's hard hour for that day. And now came Aias with his tower of shield to stand beside him. This way and that the Trojans shrank away, and soldierly Menelos led their quarry by the hand out of the fight to where his driver brought his chariot up. Now Aias, charging, brought down Doriclos, a bastard son of Priam, then he wounded Pandocos, Lysandros, and Pyrrhosos, Pilates, too. As when a river in flood from mountain snow fields reaches the flat land whipped by a storm of rain, it sweeps away hundreds of withered oaks, hundreds of pines, and casts black tons of driftwood in the sea, so Aias in his glory swept the field, wrecking both chariots and men. But Hector had no report of it, being in a fight along Scamander Bank on the left wing amid great slaughter, where a battle cry indomitable had risen around Nestor and soldierly Idomeneus. These Hector faced in battle, he performed prodigies in spearmanship and chariot handling, making havoc in the young men's ranks. And yet the Achaeans might not yet have given him passage had not Alexandros, husband of Helen, put a stop to Machaon's gallantry with one bowshot, an arrow triple barbed, in the right shoulder. And the grimmest Achaeans feared for him, feared the enemy might take him now that the tide of war had turned. Idomeneus called over at once to Nestor. Son of Nellius, glory of Achaeans, quick! Remount your car and let Machaon come aboard, and make your team race to the ships. A surgeon is worth an army full of other men at cutting shafts out, dressing arrow wounds. Nestor, Gerenian lord of horse, complied, regaining his own chariot as Machaon, son of the healer lord Asclepios, came aboard. Nestor flicked his team, and willingly they ran for their safe haven at the ships. 
At Hector's side Kebriones made out the Malay's pattern, you and I, he said, are fighting, Hector, on the outer edge of a great deafening battle. Other Trojans are in confusion, chariots and men. Telamonian Ias flurries them. I know him well, he is the one who bears the wide shield round his shoulders. Why not guide our horses toward him where the charioteers and infantry are locked in deadly combat, putting each other in the dust, their cries are never still. At this, he shook out reins to his glossy team with blowing manes, and used the cracking whip. And when they felt the lash, they drew the nimble chariot briskly on through Trojans and Achaeans, trampling shields and bodies of the dead. The axle tree beneath was blood bespattered, round the car the rails were spattered, from the horses' hoofs and from the wheel rims blood flew up in spray. Into the man eating moil, Hector now longed to plunge and make a breach, he pressed the Achaeans, never gave way an inch to any spear, but ranged among the ranks of other fighters, using his javelin, longsword, and big stones, and shunning only Ias in the combat, Zeus took it ill when he engaged his betters. Now Father Zeus, benched high on Ida, moved great Ias to retreat. He stood stock still and tossed his sevenfold shield over his shoulder, dazed with dread. With half-closed eyes he glared at the crowd, a wild thing brought to bay, turning a little, shifting knee past knee. So formidable in his fear he was, like a dun lion from a stable yard driven by hounds and farmhands, all night long they watch and will not let him take his prey, his chosen fat one. Prowling, craving meat, he cannot make a breakthrough. Volleying javelins are launched against him by strong arms, firebrands bring him to heel, for all his great elan, and heartsick he retreats at dawn. So Ias, heartsick before the Trojans, foot by foot retreated grudgingly for the ship's sake. An ass that plods along a field will be too much for attacking boys, on his dumb back stick after stick may break, still he will enter standing grain and crop it, even as boys are beating him, so puny is their strength, and barely will they drive him from the field when he is gorged on grain. In the same way the confident Trojans and their best allies continuously made the son of Telamon their target, with direct hits on his shield. Remembering his power in attack, sometimes he turned at bay and held the advance of Trojan squadrons, then resumed retreat, but kept them from the straight path to the ships while he himself, between Achaeans and Trojans, forged his way. Spears thrown by brawny hands at times would stick in his great shield, the rest stood fixed midway in earth before they reached the white flesh they were famished for. Eurypylos, Euaemon's great son, realized his danger, seeing him hard pressed by the missile hail, and moved over beside him. Stabbing out with his bright spear he hit Forzio's son, Apiseon, a marshal, in the liver under his midriff and unstrung his knees, then bent to take the armor from his shoulders. Godlike Alexandros had seen him come, now saw him strip Apiseon, in all haste he drew his bow upon Eurypylos and hit him in the right thigh with an arrow, splintering the shaft, weighting the leg. Retiring now to bleed among his men and shun black death, Eurypylos cried sharply, Friends, lords and nobles of the Argives, halt! Turn round and try to keep off death's hard hour from Ias, he is driven back by spears. I would not say for sure he will survive the grinding war. Go form a wedge for Ias, the son of Telamon. So, with his leg wound, Eurypylos begged them. And they formed the wedge for Ias, moving near, shoulder to shoulder, leaning shield on shield, with spears held high, while Ias gave way toward them. When he joined them he turned and took his stand. That way they fought as the very body of fire strives and bends, while out of battle Nelian horses foaming carried Nestor, carried Machaon. And Achilles the great runner saw Machaon. He had been standing on his ship's high stern to view the moil of war, over the rampart, heartrending struggle and pursuit. But now he called to Patroclos from the afterdeck, and hearing in the hut, the other came, rugged, it seemed, as ours, though his doom was fixed that instant. He it was spoke first, why call me out, Achilles? How can I help you? And the great runner answered, son of Menoitios, dear to my heart, the Achaeans now will come to beg and pray, I think, around my knees. Inexorable need presses upon them. Only go now, Patroclos, and ask Nestor who is this wounded man he ferries back out of the battle. All his gear behind looks like the gear of Machaon, but I could not get a good look at the man, the chariot shot beyond me at full gallop. Doing as his companion willed, Patroclos ran off along the Achaean huts and ships. Now Nestor and the wounded man, arriving at Nestor's hut, dismounted on the turf, and Eurymedon, the squire, unhitched the team. Standing against the sea breeze on the beach they cooled off, letting sweat-soaked kittens dry, then entering Nestor's hut they took their seats in armchairs. 
mulled drink was prepared for them by softly braided Hecamede, Nestor's prize from Achilles' plundering of Tenedos, Arsinoe's daughter. The Achaeans had chosen her for Nestor, honoring excellence in council. First the girl pushed up before them a beautiful table with enameled legs, then she set out a basket all of bronze, an onion to give relish to their wine, pale yellow honey, sacred barley meal, beside a cup of wondrous beauty, brought from pylos by the old king, golden nails it had for studding, and four handles on it. Each adorned by a pair of golden doves who perched to drink, with double stems beneath. Another man would strain to budge this cup once full, clear of the table. But not Nestor, although he was, he lifted it with ease. Now mixing Pramnian wine for them in this, the servant like a goddess in demeanor grated a goat's milk cheese over the wine upon a brazen grater, and sifted in white barley meal. A potion thus prepared, she called on both to drink. Now the two men drank long to rid themselves of burning thirst. In their relief they were exchanging talk when at the door Patroclos, like a god, appeared and stood. Old Nestor left his chair to take his hand, to lead him in and seat him. But from the door Patroclos shook his head and said, No time to take a chair, your grace, I will not be persuaded, he that sent me is worthy of respect and quick to anger, and sent me here to learn who that man was you brought in wounded. But I see myself it is Machaon, marshal of troops. I'll bear this word back to Achilles. Well you know how dangerous the man can be, your grace. In a flash he could accuse me without cause. Lord Nestor of Gerenia replied, How is this, that Achilles cares for any Achaeans who are hit? He has no notion of what distress has come upon the army. Wounded and out of action, our best men are lying by the ships, Lord Diams, Odysseus, the great spearman, Agamemnon, Eurypylos, hit by an arrow in the thigh, and this man whom I brought just now from war, disabled by an arrow from a bowstring. Splendid Achilles pities no Danans, waiting, is he not, until the ships on the sea verge are fanned by billowing fire, whether we Argives will or not, and we ourselves are killed off one by one. My strength is not what it was, in my bent leg or arm. If I were only young and had my powers intact, as when the quarrel rose between the Elians and ourselves for cattle raiding. I killed Itimonius, Hyperoko's son, a champion then in Elis, and drove home his rustled cattle. Trying to protect them, he met a javelin from my hand and fell, his bumpkin herdsman panicking around him. Prizes out of the plain we drove together in a great host, of cows there were fifty herds, as many flocks of sheep and droves of swine and roaming herds of goats, and chestnut horses, one hundred and fifty tawny horses, mares every one, many with suckling foals. We drove them into Pylos, Nellius land, up to the town, at night. And Nellius pride was pleased that spoil so great had fallen to me, a green hand at war. Loud in the dawnlight, heralds announced that all men who had claims on ancient Elis should present themselves, and on their assembling, leading men of Pylos made the apportionment, for there were many to whom the Epeoi were in debt. We suffered wrongs in Pylos, being a scanty people. Heracles in the years before had come with depredation, and death upon our best. Twelve, for example, were the sons of Nellius, and I alone was left, the rest were killed. These exploits puffed the Epeoi up, they showed their insolence devising crimes against us. Now our old king sequestered for himself a herd of oxen and a flock of sheep, three hundred beasts with herdsmen, for in Ellis a great debt was his due, a four-horse team of racing horses and their chariot that once would have contended in the games and raced to win the tripod, but Orgelas, lord of Elians, kept them, and sent home the empty-handed, grieving charioteer. In his long anger for these words and deeds the old king now made choice of plenty for himself, and to the people gave all the rest to be distributed, seeing to it that no man lacked his share. We were proceeding with all this, and making sacrifice around the town when on the third day the Epeoi came in multitudes, with horses driven hard, Molion's two boys among them armed, though still untrained in warfare. There's a city, Thryoessa, on a beetling hill above the Alfeos at the verge of Pylos. This they besieged, in fury to pull it down, and scoured the whole plain, but Athena bore a warning for us, running from Olympos by night, to take up arms, and she assembled troops of Pylos keen to fight. Now Nellius would not hear of my arming, hid my horses, denied I had ever learned the arts of war. Yet even so I made my mark among our charioteers, foot soldier though I was, Athena so conducted that affray. A stream called Minyeos joins the sea near Arene. Horsemen of Pylos there awaited the unearthly dawn, while infantry flowed up to join us, arming with all speed, 
by noon we reached Alfio's ancient waters, making our offerings there, to Zeus all-powerful, to Alfio's and to Poseidon, bulls, a heifer to Athena, hope of soldiers. Afterward we took our evening meal along the column by companies, and slept each man in his own gear beside the river. Meanwhile the bold invading Epeoi kept the town besieged. They burned to pull it down, but first had sight of ours handiwork. For as the flaming sun rose on the land we met them in battle, calling on Lord Zeus and on Athena. Pilians and Epeoi contended. I was the first to kill a man and take his horses, the spearman Mulios. He was Orgia's son-in-law, his sister russet-haired Agamede, she who knew all medicinal herbs the wide world hears. This man I hit with my bronze-bladed spear as he came on, and he tumbled into the dust. Then I mounted his war car, and I stood amid our forward figures. The Epeoi shrank away, this way and that, they saw their captain charioteer, splendid in battle, fallen. And my hour had come, I drove into them like a black storm cloud and captured fifty chariots. Two men bit the dust alongside each, overpowered by my spear. Then, too, I would have pillaged the two sons of Acta and Moliones, but their true sire who rules the wide sea and sets earth a tremble hid them in cloud and saved them from the war. After that, Zeus gave power into the hands of Pilians, and we pursued our enemy through all the great plain, taking many lives, amassing their fine armor, till we brought our horses to the grainland. Buprasian. Olani Rock, and the hill called Aelisios. There, as Athena made our troops turn back, I killed and left my last foe. The Achaeans withdrew briskly and turned their horses' heads toward Pylos. Among gods, they prayed to Zeus, to Nestor among men. So was I then, if that was I and not a dream. Not so Achilles, who alone gained by his valour. Ah, but I can prophesy his weeping after his people perish. My dear fellow, Menoishios made your duty doubly clear when he sent you from Thyre to Agamemnon. Standing inside, Odysseus and I overheard him, every word, so clearly. We had arrived at Peleus' great house on our recruiting journey through Elchea, and found the old soldier, Menoishios, there with you at Achilles' side. Then Peleus, master of horses, burned thigh bones to Zeus, lord of the lightning, in the enclosure of his court, and held a cup of smooth gold, pouring dusky wine on the burnt offerings. You two were carving, right and left, the carcass of the ox, when we two reached the entranceway. Achilles rose in surprise, and taking both our hands required us to rest, then placed before us all that a guest should have. We were refreshed by food and drink, and thereupon I spoke, inviting both to go with us. Most heartily you wished to go. And now your fathers both repeatedly enjoined your duties on you. The old man, Peleus, urged his child, Achilles, to do none but great feats, to be distinguished above the rest. As for Menoishios, the son of Acta, these were his words to you, my child, Achilles is a higher being by his immortal blood, but you are older. He is more powerful, but your part should be to let him hear close reasoning and counsel, even commands. He will be swayed by you for his good. These were your father's words, although you now forget them. Ah, but now, late though it is, tell all this to Achilles, hoping he may come round. Who knows what power may help a plea from you to stir his heart? There's sweetness in persuasion by a friend. If in his own mind he is keeping clear of an oracle, if her ladyship, his mother, declared to him some prophecy from Zeus, all right, then let him send you into battle. Let the battalion of Myrmidons follow you. Victory light for Danans you may be. And let him give you all his beautiful armor to wear in battle. Taking you for him the Trojans may retire from the field and let the young Achaeans have a respite exhausted as they are. War gives brief rest. You and your soldiers, fresh against tired men, might easily throw them back upon the town away from our encampment and our ships. At this, Patroclo's heart bounded within him and he went running back along the shipways toward Achilles. Just as he passed the ship of great Odysseus, where the assembly ground and place of justice were, and God's altars, there came Eurypylos, the wounded man, Euaemon's noble son, struck by the arrow, limping out of combat. Sultry sweat ran down his shoulders and his face, dark blood still trickled from his wound, but he limped on, unshaken spirit. Seeing him, Patroclos, moved to compassion, said, Poor soldiers! Captains, lords of Danans, how you all were fated here, across the sea from home, to glut wild dogs in this rich realm of Troy! But tell me this, Eurypylos, your grace, are the Achaeans holding Hector still or will they perish, down by his spear? 
Euripilos replied, Noble Patroclos, there will be no longer any defensive line of Achaeans. They will fall back on the black ship soon. Our best in other combats lie now in the camp with missile wounds or gashes made by spears in Trojan hands. Enemy power grows. As for myself, give me a hand here, take me down to your ship and cut this shaft away from my leg wound, then wash the black blood out with warm water, and sift into the wound that anodyne you learned from Achilles, a drug that, people say, the very best of centaurs, Chiron, taught him. We have surgeons, Podolarios and Machaon, but the one I think is lying wounded in his hut, himself in need of a healer, and the other faces the Trojan charge, still in the plain. The staunch son of Menoetios replied, How can this be? What action can we take, Euripilos? I am on my way to give Achilles counsel from old Nestor of Gerenia, lord of the western approaches to Achaia. But not for that will I neglect or fail you, badly hurt as you are. Supporting him with one arm round him, under his chest, he led him into the hut. A squire put oxides out on which he laid the wounded man, then took his sheath knife and laid open the man's thigh to excise the biting arrow. With warm water he washed the black blood flowing from the wound, then rubbed between his hands into a powder over the wound a bitter yarrow root, that dulled all pangs of pain. Now the gash dried as the blood and powder clotted, 